and let me start recording. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today we are going to start um, a new chapter. Um, but before we start, let me ask you whether you have any uh, questions about the midterm exam. Uh, the objections for for the objections, Ozoja is going to send an announcement uh, so that you will be uh, able to. Uh, Set, submit your objections um, in, in order to class if you have any uh, but the average was I think around uh, 60 uh, and there are a couple of students who got full credit 100 so uh, and I also sold the midterm myself uh, one day before the midterm uh, it was uh, I, I didn't use Octave online, I just used Calculator and I was able to finish it in about one and a half hour. Uh, I got, myself, I got 91.5 uh, because I had a mistake. I, uh, for a vector, I changed this, uh, I mixed it, I, I mixed up its uh, Y and Z coordinates. So it was a small calculation error, but I got, uh, I, I, I was able to get 91. 0.5 myself. So, um, I, I believe true false questions were uh, nice to have uh, so that you get some break out of those calculation uh, intensive questions. Uh, but if you have any feedback about the midterm exam, uh, please feel free to send us an email or uh, write a post in call. Uh, we are also, although we are using Oticlus as the main announcement uh, medium, but uh, feel free to uh, also post in on Cal, uh, which uh, we are also monitoring. Um, now, uh, today we are going to talk about the forward rendering pipeline uh, and clipping and culling stages of the forward rendering pipeline. Uh, we have already uh, finished the first part of the forward rendering pipeline, which is also uh, called uh, vertex processing with the modeling, uh, viewing, and uh, viewport transformations. Uh, we are able to uh, finish the first step of the forward rendering pipeline. We are, today we are going to see the second step, clipping and culling. And uh, then uh, next week we are going to talk about rasterization, how on the pixel space we draw triangles, lines, and this will come complete the, I mean, the, the theory behind the forward rendering pipeline, then we will start talking about OpenGL uh, in the last uh, four weeks or so, uh, which is an implementation of this forward rendering pipeline uh, that you also have a chance to experience with. And also the good thing is that we can write code that runs on the GPU, which is uh, called so-called hardware acceleration. All right, so uh, let me go ahead and start uh, the the forward rendering pipeline. I already, in the previous weeks, when I started talking about modeling and uh, viewing transformations, uh, I also uh, talked about uh, how uh, forward rendering pipeline works. But let me quickly uh, do a recap of what we have done. It's, again, we are solving the same problem. Uh, we have a virtual world. Uh, actually, it is written here. Let me turn on orientate. So we have a 3D virtual world. Uh, any computer graphics, 3D computer graphics algorithm, its goal is to take a photograph of this. We have a camera somewhere here, uh, which is looking into the scene, and our goal is to take a photograph of this uh, virtual world and get a picture in a 2D window. Uh, the, in the forward rendering pipeline, which is uh, here, let me clear these, which is actually uh, here on the starting on the fourth slide, uh, is, uh, it's called forward rendering pipeline because it starts with the vertices and it goes in the last stage to the pixels. If you remember, in the, uh, the ray tracing algorithm is also called backward rendering. The reason is that we start with our pixels and try to go back to where the, those rays intersect, uh, try to find uh, fragments, the, the points on, on the surfaces to compute the color. So we are in this pipeline, it's a forward rendering, we are following the ray, uh, rays from the objects, from the uh, real uh, objects. And so that's, that's why it's called forward rendering pipeline. Uh, there are uh, implementations on it on hardware and software. You can just 
implement the forward rendering pipeline purely uh, by using C, C++ as if we did on ray tracing. But uh, just running everything on CPU uh, it may be very slow. Uh, so there's hardware developed specifically for forward rendering pipeline that we use these days, which are highly parallel. And OpenGL and Direct3D uh, by Microsoft. Uh, OpenGL is backed by a large consortium of graphics cards, vendors, uh, software, uh, I mean, also large companies. So OpenGL is also a nice library. Uh, you may have heard in the news a couple of years back, uh, I mean, like Apple, for example, is no longer using OpenGL. It's now using a different library named Vulkan or Meta metal, uh, metal, uh, let's see, uh, metal or Vulcan, uh, Apple. So if you go, yeah, so this is actually now the uh, if you're going to develop for uh, Mac OS or iOS. Uh, so there are some observations. I mean, this is this is a develop, this is a forum post, but uh. So uh, these are uh, basically uh, the library Apple uses uh, now, uh, and it's no longer supporting OpenGL. But it's uh, there's there are ways to port OpenGL programs to uh, Metal or or vice versa, and also OpenGL and Direct3D. It's not so difficult if when you, after you have your main application, uh, you can produce two versions, which one of which runs on OpenGL, the other on Direct3D. But these are basically uh, APIs that allow you to access hardware capabilities and do this, run the rendering pipeline. And in the recent years also, you may also have uh, seen uh, the use of GPUs. Uh, in deep learning, for example, in machine learning, GPU is also like a very uh, cru crucial, critical hardware. They have become a crucial hardware uh, because the hardware that was originally specifically developed for this purpose, for the rendering pipeline, uh, people have seen uh, this parallelization in other applications too uh, and started using that hardware for general purpose programming, not specifically for rendering pipeline. So hence this term came about, which is GPGPU, uh, which is general purpose uh, GPU programming. Yeah, that's that's true. So there's a question uh, by a, a side, uh, and he's asking whether in the industry the uh, forward rendering pipeline is the dominant way to do the rendering pipeline, and that has been so in the last 30 years or so, maybe 30, 40 years since the first PCs came about. The forward rendering pipeline is the de facto standard of doing computer graphics programming. Uh, in applications uh, in, in, in the industry. So ray tracing has become uh, popular in the last uh, couple of days, uh, years, um, thanks to, again, the developments in hardware. Uh, these hardware vendors, they're tuning, maybe they're producing new versions that, that are capable of handling ray tracing automatically, also in parallel. So, uh, yeah, the RTX cards, exactly those RTX cards. I mean, if you look at the history of RTX cards, maybe they are, they are fairly uh, new. Uh, they are, and yeah, you're right, Mugella, and uh, they're developed to optimize. Uh, they're optimized in terms of hardware for ray tracing. So ray tracing now is seeing some popularity in games as well. Uh, or in other applications, but yeah, OpenGL is, I don't think, oh, maybe in the, re, me, uh, I mean, maybe we are going to be seeing some ray tracing related functionalities in OpenGL, we may be seeing those, but right now, these OpenGL and Direct3D, they are purely forward rendering pipeline oriented libraries. So they have a very, uh, these graphics cards, they have a, actually there's a default um, pipeline, uh, the the default forward rendering pipeline, which is programmable. So that's that's another interesting thing. If you don't need, to, you can have an OpenGL application, if, uh, which actually just says sends data to the system, sets some parameters, and leave everything to the 
GPU saying that run the default rendering pipeline and these are the parameters so you're allowed to, so all these steps are going to automatically taken care by the GPU okay so this is the default forward rendering pipeline but the good thing about GPUs is that they are programmable you can actually write your own code for vertex processing and replace the default one with your code so which allows people to do things that were not possible in the default forward rendering pipeline. They can replace the, the, the fragment processing part, for example, uh, to add new effects, uh, which is not in the default pipeline, which is not possible with parameters. Uh, one thing, one example that I can think, uh, think of is this uh, uh, shading with, by interpolating normals. So, in OpenGL, we are going to see this in the following weeks, but let me tell you this. So we are def, uh, limited to vertices. So in order for, in, for efficiency, when we are rendering a triangle like this, uh, when we are trying to find a color for a point inside the triangle, imagine this triangle is going to be rasterized as, as a large triangle like this on your image. And uh, let's imagine we are focusing on this uh, point on the triangle. So in ray tracing, what we do is uh, we actually directly find this ray, find uh, whether the, these vectors from this point to the light, uh, whether we are going to have a specular spot here. So different the different points on the triangle may have different colors based on the specular reflection they are going to get, right? So we are, we are doing things that are really uh, in high resolution, focusing on a point inside a triangle in ray tracing. But in OpenGL and in the default rendering pipeline, you have two modes for shading. One of them is flat shading, which tells you that whatever you compute for these vertices, one of them is going to be used to color the entire triangles inside with the same color. This is called flat. And there's a um, constant in OpenGL uh, header file uh, that says, I think in gl.h, there's a constant for this, gl flat, which you set the parameter saying that this is the shading model that I'm going to use, flat shading, single color. So what happens is that only colors for these vertices are computed. And one of those colors is going to, I mean, I don't know which, which if, they're, if these three colors are different from each other, which one of them is going to be used for this uh, point inside the triangle. I, I have to look at OpenGL specifications to figure, find that out, but basically, uh, I don't know in that detail at this moment. But uh, what I know is that and, and the entire triangle is going to be, whichever pixel, it doesn't matter, it's going to be a constant color. There's another shading model uh, OpenGL pro provides, which is this gel smooth with gel smooth parameter. You can say that I don't want constant color within the triangle. I want the triangle to be colored smoothly. And what happens is that if you have three different colors uh, that are computed for these vertices, these colors are interpolated. They are uh, we use a similar like uh, just like we did in texture coordinate finding by similar to barycentric coordinate usage. We actually find the color, compute a color for this as an average of these three colors, but it's also it's interpolated across. First, I, the interpolation is done uh, line by line like this actually, and starting of each line, the interpolation is done by using how far this. Uh, point on the edge is close to this vertex or this vertex. So we we start with this color, and then along this line, we know a constant. We we compute a constant amount of increment or decrement to those color channels, and we do it very fast, line by line, on this triangle. We are going to see these next week in rasterization. But look at these two models. Colors are computed, and that's it. And they're uh, computed i mean this the point uh, the color for this point inside is can only be interpolated by the vertex colors now 
This is also this kind of an interpolation of colors computed for vertices also has a name. It's called Gorot shading. This is called this is a uh, this is a shading uh, model which says compute the color for the vertices and interpolate for the for the inside. So this Gorot shading. Uh, what will happen is that if there is a, for example, a specular shiny spot for your specular component, which is only effective in this region of the triangle, you will not be able to see that specular spot because this specular spot does not affect these C1, C2, C3. Uh, your triangles inside will not have that shiny spot if you have a very, very large triangle. So, uh, in order to, if you want to have the specular spot correctly, viewed, one thing you can do is you have to make your triangles maybe smaller to catch that spot. But I mean, that's, as you can see, this is disadvantage. It's a less detailed, faster method, but uh, than ray tracing and this color computation only for the vertices. There is another uh, algorithm for shading, which is called Fong shading, which uh, you may have, I mean, we, we have, you already know this name from Blink Fong shading. And in that Algorithm, what happens is that instead of computing colors for these uh, vertices, let's compute normal vectors, which may be different based on if these vertices are neighboring to other faces around it. We can compute normal vectors for the vertices, and for a point inside here, instead of computing the color as an average of these, let's compute the average normal. Let's interpolate the normal, and run, after that, uh, run the elimination model, compute the color from this interpolated normal for this point uh, inside. So compute a color from scratch for every pixel one by one. It's much slower than um, Gorot shading. But what I want to tell you is that this is not possible in OpenGL default forward rendering pipeline. Uh, I mean, it wasn't possible 10 years ago, maybe they have put it now, but I, I don't think it's possible. Uh, in the, f still the uh, default forward rendering pipeline. But uh, so there was no uh, parameter in OpenGL that says GL Fong. There, is no, there was no GL Fong uh, thing that you could use to set up this kind of an algorithm. So it was not possible. But the good thing about this pipeline being uh, programmable is that you can replace the default pipeline with your own code, which will allow you to do funk shading, implement funk shading by saying that I don't want to interpolate the colors. Let's pass the normal vectors to the next stages of the pipeline. And when we are computing the color of a pixel in fragment processing, we say that, okay, I'm going to compute the color here right now. I'm not going to use the interpolated color. Here is the interpolated normal that I get as input from the previous parts of the pipeline. And I'm going to be using those value, uh, interpolated normal. I know where the light is, things like And I'm I will be computing color for every pixel separately. So we can, we can do that with this programmable rendering pipeline. And this is what GPUs provide us. It allows us uh, to replace certain parts. So how do you replace it? We're going to talk about those later, but I just want to, since I mentioned about those code that we can use to replace parts of the pipeline, I just want to show you some example uh, code, how it, how it looks like. So I have some uh, shader examples here. Oh, this is user. CNG 477. So in, I think in here, maybe even earlier than that, shaders. Yes, yeah, so I have some shader examples uh, on my uh, personal repository for graphics, uh, the CNG 477. And in 2003, uh, I think it was the first time we started talking about programmable GPUs in this course. Um, let me show you this one, Vertex Font. Look at this. How short is this code? It looks like OpenGL, but it is different than OpenGL. As you can see, there are some differences. What does this varying mean? And this is an earlier version of uh, uh, 
programmable GPU vertex shader code. The newer version uh, specifies these modifiers as in and out variables. We are going to come to those, but there's, I just want to show you that there are certain things here that doesn't exist in C, C++, because this, what, what we have here, is actually in, what, uh, in a language called GLSL. Uh, graphic language, graphics, shader language. Uh, the GL shader, shader language. So we have some vectors. These are, we don't need to include any library for these. Vectors, matrices are, uh, diff um, I mean, variables that are standards in GLSL. And so what this vertex shader is that uh, I'm going to have this normal light vector and position uh, that will, I will have as as I want this, these variables to be interpolated for pixels, but this is a code for a single vertex. So look at this, what we're doing. You get the original vertex coordinates. We multiply it with the model view projection matrix, which was a parameter we get from OpenGL side. And this is the, the vertex processing part, which is just matrix multiplication. And this, look at this multiplication. This is our regular matrix, regular multiplication, knowing that this is VEC4, and this is uh, GL vertex is VEC4 by default, and this is a 4x4 matrix, MAT4. It can just do the matrix multiplication also automatically. This is the normal matrix we are using, which is the, that top norm. Remember, the vectors are transformed differently than vertices, and therefore this GL normal vector is uh, transformed differently than the other. And this is our light vector the, to the light, and we have this is our position, which we don't want to project. This position we want in the camera coordinate system because we will use this position in the other fragment shader to compute the color. So I just want to show you now the other code. So this is the second piece of code, which is also not that long, but this is the entire color computation done per pixel level. We have the same variables uh, as the previous one. These are now, this norm variable that is as, as is used here is not the per vertex value anymore. It's automatically interpolated for our pixel by using the vertices, the, by using the values computed in the vertex processing part before. So these are all interpolated values and it automatically comes here. And this is, I say, I'm going to compute the color by using the, this is how we compute the health vector. Look at this, these, these functions, normalize or other uh, functions like clamp uh, that about vectors, they are again part of the GLSL language, which uh, we don't need to include any libraries or so. But this is, we see how we uh, use the basic elimination model to compute ambient, uh, diffuse, and specular parts and add them all together uh, as a vector and clamp it uh, between zero and one and set the color of this pixel, this fragment, to be this computed color. Okay, so this is uh, done for a pixel, and this is the implementation of that phone shading algorithm, which wasn't possible in the default pipeline. Default pipeline does not have this color computation at the fragment level, and it's uh, done at the vertex level. The color computation is done automatically at the vertex level in the default pipeline. But uh, as you can see, this small piece of code, and it's, it's written in such a way that it just focuses on a single pixel. So this single code is compiled and run on the GPU in parallel for all the fragments, for all the frag parts of triangles in parallel automatically. So we are writing a single code and it's uh, executed for all the parts of triangles that map to our image automatically. We are going to come to details of these later. Uh, okay, so this was just, I did a sidetrack um, just to show this, this rendering pipeline. Parts of it are programmable and the, the parts that we will program are vertex processing and fragment processing parts. And the code that we write sometimes they're called shaders. When you write a vertex shader, uh, I mean, the, the, actually that term is a little bit misleading because shading is about 
uh, really finding the colors of uh, those parts of triangles. Yeah, I mean, when you're doing vertex processing, you're not shading the vertex. You, you're not necessarily running the shading algorithm, right? Uh, but uh, I mean, this, the, that term somehow stuck with it. So every, every part of these, like geometry shader, fragment shader, vertex shader, the code that you write to replace these parts are called shader code. And uh, this is how uh, we rewrite. When you write your code, it replaces the, uh, the default one entirely. So you cannot replace part of it. You cannot update the existing one. When you tell the GPU, run my code, either it's entirely, you have to re be responsible of everything what the vertex processor is already doing. Otherwise, it will not run correctly. So you're entirely replacing that part with your code. But as you guess, this is called forward. This is a really a pipeline of certain things. There is a certain order of these steps. We start with the vertices. Uh, when, when we don't modify the other parts, they are done automatically by the GPU. You don't need to uh, modify the entire pipeline. Just parts of it can be replaced with your own code. And as I said, the most popular parts that we uh, replace are the vertex processing parts and fragment processing parts, which is about computing the colors of the pixels. It's called fragment. Why is it called a pixel? Uh, you may think about fragments as uh, parts of objects that are potential pixels. That are actual, they are actually discrete pixel level things, but the thing is that at the same pixel there may be uh, multiple objects that project onto the same pixel. Which one of, uh, for example, you may have a, a rectangle part, you may have a rectangle fragment that falls onto the same pixel, and you may have a different triangle, its own part may also pro be projected onto the same pixel. Which one of these two colors are going to get to be the pixel? Pixel because it's the final color you're going to see on the image. Uh, it depends on which one is in front or whether you are going to have uh, transparency or not, things like that. So therefore, uh, we don't call them pixels at this stage because uh, if the triangle is at the back, for example, uh, its pixel is not going to be get to be pixel. So fragments are potential uh, pixels. You may think about them like this. And all this rasterization step also, which is the interpolation of these parameters, is done automatically. Uh, today we are going to talk about clipping and culling. This primitive assembly is also done. It's some a logical step actually. Uh, in the last two weeks before the midterm exam, we have seen this transformations in vertex processing, modeling, camera transformation. The viewport transformation does not happen yet. So only uh, modeling, model view projection. So model transformation, then camera transformation, then projection transformation happens at this stage. And primitive assembly means that which vertices form which groups of objects. For example, these three vertices form a triangle. These four vertices form a rectangle. That's what primitive assembly means. Uh, we have different primitives, triangles, lines, rectangles. And at this point, spheres are no longer uh, like in ray tracing, we, have, we nicely had the sphere mathematical function. Spheres are no longer uh, primitive objects here. If you want to render a sphere, uh, you have to um, subdivide uh, either starting with a rectangle, uh, I mean rectangular prism, you may, you, but with subdivision with lots of triangles, you can model a sphere. You can find quotes for that uh, on, on the web. And clipping and culling is the process of removing or modifying primitives that are either culling is about when they're completely outside, we get rid of them so that we they don't get to the, they're not going to be visible on our photograph image anyway. So we are removing them. And in clipping, we are removing parts of objects that are partially inside but partially outside. Again, we don't want to deal with the parts that are outside, so we also clip, just cut them, and only deal with the parts that are inside. And at this point, we are going to have visible primitives uh, that are going to be inside our canonical view volume. Then we transform it to our pixel space, 
Now we'll have primitives with their 2D coordinates. Now, after this point in the pipeline, we will be completely on the 2D discretized image space, and which the rasterization occurs line, triangle, drawing, filling inside the triangles. And in fragment processing, we deal with uh, whether things are in front, at the back, we put some additional effects on them, and things like that. Okay, so uh, that's called, yeah, fragment uh, processing is the final attachment of a color to a certain pixel. So all this uh, is actually detailed in the slides that are coming. So we have done vertex processing, primitive assembly is the process of grouping, it's just a logical grouping of the objects, no actual objects are visible at this point. Clipping and culling, as I said, we are going to either partially remove objects or completely remove objects. And with viewport transformation, all put the surviving uh, primitives that are now inside our canonical viewport, they acquire viewport coordinates. Now, at the, after this point, we have integer pixel coordinates being come to 2D after this point. And the depth value also can be uh, normalized to 0, 1 values, not between minus 1 and 1. And, uh, I mean, there's some... Side note here, uh, unless changed by GL depth range. So this is an OpenGL function call, which tells you that if you call this function, you can change these default values of depth that is between 0 and 1 to something between, for example, 0 and 10 or 0 and 100 or 1 and 5, whatever your favorite two boundary values are. You can change that depth range, uh, default depth range by calling a function in that case, uh, they will be between those two values. This is just a linear normalization of the depth values. And rasterization is a very important step, which we are going to see, uh, is basically is the process of determining pixels, which pixels are on the image, are part of this line or part of this triangle. And how do we interpolate the color along that line or inside that triangle? So there are different rasterization algorithms for lines, triangles. So uh, at this point, I also want to mention uh, your second assignment, which is going to be implementation of these stages up to this point. So we already done the vertex processing. And so your second assignment is going to be a software. Uh, We're not going to be using GPUs or OpenGL or any library at this point, but it's just going to be a very simple uh, implementation in C++ of this, uh, of this rendering pipeline. We are going to get the same input as in the ray tracing. This time, instead of you're going to completely replace your ray tracing algorithm with this new one, you'll, you're, you'll have your vertices, your triangle information again in your mesh XML file. Now for each vertex, you're first going to multiply them with this 4x4 matrix you're going to form based on where the camera is. So everything we have seen up to now in class, you will have a chance to actually make that happen by implementing parts of it. And you'll see really uh, those vertices. Uh, I mean, at the end, again, you're going to get a single image, as in ray tracing, but this time with no shadows or... Um, no reflections of other objects. Uh, I mean, the quality of the, your second assignment is going to look worse than your first assignment, actually. But uh, you will see, uh, you will have a, your own implementation of a simple OpenGL library, uh, which uh, is I mean, a very simple implementation of uh, the, this forward rendering pipeline. And we plan to post it, I think, this Friday. Uh, which you may start directly. We will not know rasterization by then, but uh, the first two parts, vertex processing, clipping and culling, you will be able to start working on the assignment right away. And again, we are going to give three weeks uh, for this uh, programming assignment. Yeah, and finally, each fragment uh, is given a color or some, there may, sometimes there may be some effects that we can have on fragment processing. And this fragment processing, it has a, its intermediate steps, uh, um, sometimes may be very complicated. There's a pipeline on its own. Okay, 
Now uh, we can start with this part of the pipeline now, clipping and culling. So we are not going to do anything about primitive assembly. It's going to be done automatically by uh, this, or I mean, this is done logically. We are not going to see any algorithms or uh, steps for this part. Now we are going to talk about clipping and culling. Viewport transform, we also talked about this uh, during viewing transformations. The only two things before we can finish this software implementation is the clipping and culling and rasterization parts, which are this week's and the following week's topics. And the, the slides of both uh, topics should be up on our Oticlus. Okay, now, uh, yeah, we have now go through the four spheres, we don't have any spheres anymore. Um, in modern graphics API, there are essentially three kinds of primitives, points, line, and triangles. There are also polygons, quads in OpenGL, but I think when they are rendered maybe in the hardware, they are turned, they may be turned into triangles. I'm not so sure about that, but yeah, these are, these will be our main, uh, for our purposes in this course, uh, I mean, for the remainder of this course, points, line, and triangles will be our basic primitive objects that we draw. Uh, clipping points is straightforward. I mean, points are not clipped, actually. Points are dimensionless ob objects. Uh, I mean, clipping a point means that I mean, you cannot cut a point into two. Uh, they don't have any dimension. You basically cull them. You remove them if they're, they're uh, x, y, z coordinates with just a simple if if con a couple of if conditions, you can just take a look at the coordinate. If its coordinates uh, are outside this canonical viewing volume, you just reject it. So this is rejecting it means it's removing it from the remaining parts of the pipeline. We are not going to have this point deal dealt with in, in the subsequent uh, pipeline steps. Uh, we are going to see algorithms for line clipping. Uh, the cohen sutherland algorithm and Liam Barsky algorithm, these are very old algorithms, uh, but they may uh, still be in use. And in polygon clipping, the sutherland Hodgman algorithm. So we are going to see three algorithms in this course uh, today. If we can finish all of them, uh, we may start talking about rasterization uh, on even on Thursday, but let's see how it goes. Probably we'll not have time to finish all three of these algorithms. So clipping is done in clip space, meaning that it's done in a uh, coordinate system in which uh, the W component is not actually, the perspective divide has not been done yet. So this clip space is something, it's like a homogeneous coordinate system. So the, uh, the following a couple of slides is actually giving you information about how it's done actually in OpenGL. Uh, but the algorithms that we will be seeing in this course are going to be simple algorithms that we accomplish these in uh, 2D. Okay, we'll, we'll see 2D clipping and culling algorithms, but their ex uh, application to 3D, their extension to 3D is also not that uh, difficult. So, you remember, after the transformation, if you look at this perspective transformation matrix in which this uh, third column value has a minus one, which means that the W component, the fourth dimension of our points will be equal to minus Z. Okay, so uh, we, are in a, we are not in 3D space right now. We, and in order to get the 3D space back, we need to divide everything by this minus Z. But the clipping actually is done before this division is done. Because, so this slide, again, as I said, some additional knowledge which tells you how it's actually done in OpenGL or other uh, forward rendering pipelines. Uh, but when we are doing the actual clipping, we are not going to uh, do that. We are, we are going to simplify and just clip against uh, some rectangles in 2D. So the, to find whether a point or part of a line is in the canonical view volume, we need to get to these three dimensions and divide this last component. This is called perspective divide. But when the actual clipping implementation, so we need to compare whether x divided by w is between minus 1 and 1 to see in order to see whether the x coordinate is going to be clip or not. But instead of doing that, if you look at this equation, instead of comparing x with uh, x, I mean x divided by w with minus one and one, 
if we get this w to left and right, we can directly check x with minus w and w. If x is between these two values, then it's not going to be eclipsed. So this, this comparison is mathematically equal to this comparison. So instead of doing the division, which is going to save us lots of precious computation time, we do the clipping by comparing x against these w uh, coordinates. So this is how uh, the clipping is done to, for efficiency. Uh, this the same goes for y and z uh, components. Uh, the finally division by w may make objects behind the viewer. Uh, I mean, this division by w uh, has some problems. These are, uh, I think, the biggest thing is this uh, for efficiency. I mean, instead of dividing each coordinate by w, you can compare them directly like this, which will save some computation. We will we will be dividing them later, but we will divide be dividing points by w at the end, after this stage, only if they are within the viewing volume. Clipped points, rejected, completely removed primitives, we don't need to do perspective divide for them. I think that's a big uh, efficiency point. Okay, yeah, so here, this, after these two uh, slides that tells you how it's done in uh, the clip space in OpenGL or other forward trending pipelines, uh, we get back to our algorithms. For simplicity, we are just going to show you 2D uh, versions of these algorithms. Uh, a 2D box with coordinates between x min, x max, y min, y max. So these may be minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1. Or here, they may be minus w, w. If actually we follow the same thing OpenGL does. x min, uh, we are going to be comparing our x coordinates, for example, between minus w and w. Y also between minus W, this is going to be minus W, this is going to be W if we uh, do this in the clip space. Now, how, how does this coincident algorithm work? Uh, it assigns uh, it, it, uh, some bit codes, which are called outcodes, to the end points of the lines first. So this is both of these algorithms that we're first going to see, that the Cohen-Sutherland and Liam barsky algorithms, they are for line clipping. So uh, the problem is this, we are given a line, so let me write it here, this new slide. So we are given a line here, uh, first of all we have this clipping window, x min, y min, these corners are at these, and x max, uh, y max, so this is given to us, this is our clipping window, and we have a line. Let me use a different color for our line. And we have a line here. Our goal is, our goal in clipping, or we may have many lines. Okay, I, I know, sh I'm showing you three different versions in which the entire line is within the clipping window. So nothing is removed. The line remains same and passed as is to the uh, subsequent pipeline steps. Uh, but this line, uh, let's call this line two. This is line one, this is line three. So line two is going to be completely reject. This one passes the test, this one is completely rejected, and line three is going to be modified to be this line, okay? We don't want these parts of the lines to be passed forward because these parts of the line are not going to be visible. So clipping uh, really means with, uh, uh, a pair of scissors here, we are just clipping it, just a snip snip, and this uh, line is gone, and it's now this is this new line. So how can we do this efficiently? Um, for example, how can we accept uh, them trivially, reject them trivially? So what happens is that these outcodes, let me tell you what these outcodes are. Uh, each clipping boundary, so this, actually when you see this clipping window, a rectangle is nothing but the inside of this rectangle is the intersection of four half spaces. Uh, so it's a very 
unorthodox way of saying what a rectangle is. It's an intersection of these four half spaces. These half spaces are actually each of these boundaries. For example, this left clipping boundary is saying, basically, this edge is saying that anything to the left of me, so this clipping boundary is this line, x is equal to x min line. If you look at this, x is equal to x min line, this is this vertical line. And it's basically saying that anything to the left of it is outside. It's saying nothing more than this. Each edge contains this information about the rectangle. It's saying for me, anything to the left of me, anything less than x min is outside the rectangle. And anything that is to the right of it is inside the triangle. So this left boundary actually does not know whether this point is outside or this point is outside. It's just this because this point and this point according to the left boundary they are inside actually that are, that are to, to its right. So what will determine that these are outside? The other clipping boundaries, the other the other edges. So the what we see inside here, the triangle inside is the part that all clipping boundaries agree upon. That I mean, it's just like an end condition. If it's inside all of these four clipping boundaries, then inside the triangle. As I said, it's a it's an overly complicated way of describing a rectangle uh, like this, but it will help you just uh, to focus on, for example, this left boundary is just giving us one bit of information whether for, for a point, whether something is inside or outside. Now, by using this, we can actually represent uh, any point with four bit codes. Okay, uh, or 0, 0, 0, there are 16 possible different uh, cases. These four bit codes, basically, they all correspond to, uh, for example, the bit 0. This one is bit 0, left edge. So this one, as you can see, uh, if you look at these outcodes on this uh, slide, uh, you're going to see that this one, the, the least significant bits of these are all 111. It means that they're outside. They're called outcodes, which, which means that it's one, that respective bit is one, when a point is to the outside with respect to this boundary. Each of these digits, they correspond to a certain clipping boundary. So the least significant bit is left edge, then this one is right edge, as you can see, one, 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 okay? And it's all zeros on the, on the left-hand side. And bit two here is the bottom edge, one, one, and one. And the most significant bit on the left, leftmost bit is for the top edge, as you can see, one, 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 it's out. Okay, if we give these bit, bit codes, it's simple to give these bit codes to any any point but with just some simple checks. Well, I mean, for example, if it's just a single if condition, right? I mean, if its y coordinate is larger than y max, uh, its bit three is one. If its y coordinate is less than y min, if uh, then its bit two is one. Otherwise, its bit two is zero. So it's just with four if conditions, we can just set these bits. After we have these bits, what can we do with them? Uh, one thing we can do is this. For example, for a line, a line will have two bit out codes for its first vertex and for this second vertex. Let's call this bit code or out code. Let's call them this these functions OV1 and OV2 which are just some, some codes, okay, 4-bit codes like this. For example, if this is 0, 1, 0, and if this is 0, 0, 1, 1, if I have these two lines like this, I can directly tell you this, this line is completely outside without actually looking at the line. I can tell you this line has to be completely outside because there is this simple, simple rule if the bitwise end of these two bit codes is uh, equal to one, okay, uh, or 
I mean, it's not equal to zero, we can say, because when you do bitwise n, it's going to be another four bit number. It may be, uh, it may be something other than, well, maybe two, four, or eight, two. Uh, so if it's not equal to zero, this is, let me tell you this, if it's not equal to zero, uh, this line, reject this line completely, it has to be completely outside. Uh, so, for example, uh, it, we'll see. So, this is how this coin settlement algorithm works actually uh, by looking at these uh, bit codes. First, it does this trivial reject and trivial accept cases are found by just simple bitwise operations of these points. And then, if these trivial, yeah, here, handle trivial accept and trivial rejects. If the bitwise end of out codes are non zero, reject the line entirely. It has to be. It has to be completely outside because just if we the only thing the bitwise end is going to be non-zero is that both out codes of the endpoints uh, are one for some boundary, which means that the line has to be completely on one side of the outside part of one boundary, and that means it's, therefore it's completely outside. And if the both out codes codes are completely zero. I mean, if you have zero, 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 it's inside, and, and the other is also zero, 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 zero. Or if their bitwise or is zero, again, we, for the bitwise operation, we can say that the line is completely inside and accept the line entirely. Now, but if these two cases do not occur, uh, our lines may still be completely outside. Okay, so this is not an if and only if condition. The second condition is not an if and only if type of thing. I mean, in order to be completely outside, you can have uh, the bitwise end zero. Okay, uh, I mean, if you do the bitwise end of uh, out goes for these endpoints, you're going to see that it is zero. Doesn't mean that the line is not completely outside. The line can still be completely outside, but it's not a trivial reject that we can do. We cannot distinguish between this line and this line directly by looking at the outs, out codes. This, this line is partially inside, this partial is, line is completely outside, but we need to uh, process them individually with more detailed algorithm next. And what we will be doing is that by we will just start clipping them one by one for each clipping plane, clipping uh, edge okay we will start processing there are th four clipping edges we are first going to clip for example this line by using the bottom one if you for example if you try to clip it by using the left one uh it's not clipped it remains the same nothing happens if, after we process it with respect to the left when we process it with respect to the right its second uh, end point becomes this one this part is clipped then maybe the bottom one after the bottom one for example we see that it will be a trivial except because this part and this part is gone that we don't need to do the third line. So this is how the coincidental algorithm will work. I just tried to summarize this quickly. You're going to see the details, uh, but let's have a uh, 10 minute break until 10.43. I will stop recording now, uh, but yeah, we are, we are going to continue with this algorithm after a 10 minute break.